I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King, Jr., delivered the 28th of August, 1963, at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. And there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to generate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. We are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, 
little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will one day be free. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom's ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And even though the children aren't with us this morning, we think everybody likes a good story, so we're going to tell you one. This is the story of Higgins, a drop with a dream. Once upon a time, there was a drop of water named Higgins. Now, Higgins was no ordinary drop of water. Higgins was a drop with a dream. Higgins lived in a valley where it had not rained in a very long time. What was once beautiful, lovely green grass was turning brown. All the beautiful flowers were wilting. The trees were starting to droop. But Higgins had a dream that one day the valley would be a beautiful place again. But what could he do? After all, he was only a drop of water. Well, one day Higgins decided to travel and tell others about his dream. All the other drops listened very politely, but no one believed his dream would come true. Higgins, get your head out of the clouds. You can't spend your whole life dreaming. Well, Higgins decided that he did have to do something to make his dream come true, so he began to think. And he thought. And he thought. And then one day, when he was out for a walk... He passed a rusty bucket, and he got an idea. If enough of us drops got together in this bucket, there would be enough water to sprinkle on a few flowers and help them grow, and they'd be beautiful again. Eagerly, Higgins told everybody about his idea, but everybody thought he was being foolish. That Higgins, he's nothing but a dreamer, they said. Well, Higgins decided he needed to do something to convince the others that he was right. So he said to them, I don't know about you, but I'm getting into that bucket. I hope you will join me. Then there might be enough water to at least help some of the flowers grow. So Higgins ran as hard as he could and leaped up into the air and landed with a kerplunk at the bottom of the bucket. And there he sat, just a drop in the bucket. For a long time, Higgins was very lonely. It seemed like no one else was going to join him. But after a while, some other drops could see the grass was getting browner, and the flowers were wilting more, and the trees were really drooping. And they all agreed that something had to be done. Suddenly, one drop shouted, I'm getting in the bucket with Higgins. And he leaped through the air, and he landed kerplunk in the bucket. And then two other drops yelled, wait for us. And they hopped through the air. And then 10 drops jumped. And then 20 drops jumped. And then 30. And then 50. And then there were 100 drops and they filled up the bucket. And then there were more drops that wanted to jump. So they went out and they found more buckets. And then there were two buckets. And then there were five buckets. And then there were 100 buckets. And they were all full of water. And along came a powerful breeze that blew over all the buckets, and all the water flowed together to make a mighty stream. And everywhere the water flowed, the grass turned green again, the flowers bloomed, and the trees once more stood tall and straight. 
And all this happened because Higgins had a dream, and his dream came true. Because he knew that although he was just a drop in the bucket, enough drops in enough buckets can roll down and make righteousness like a mighty stream. Do you trust democracy? In his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, Parker Palmer opens with words from conservationist Terry Tempest Williams. The human heart is the first home of democracy. It is where we embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings, not just with our minds, and offer our attention rather than our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up, ever trusting our fellow citizens to join with us in our determined pursuit of a living democracy? The Unitarian Universalist principle to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all beings is, brings us to civil rights. Our respect for the interdependent web connects us to environmental justice. Day in and day out, we draw these connections. Our fifth UU principle isn't so subtle. It directly states UU congregations will affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Right there, we view the democratic process as a principle of faith. It's not new. When the Unitarian Universalists merged in 1961, it stated this way, UU congregations affirm, defend, and promote the supreme worth of every human personality, the dignity of man, and the use of the democratic method in human relations. Lifting democracy is one of our religious principles that goes back even further. In the 1940s, Reverend A. Powell Davies, minister at the All Souls Unitarian Church in D.C., successfully had the democratic method identified as a nationwide core value of faith. Davy was born in England at the turn of the century. I was trained as a Methodist minister. He came to the U.S. in 1928 and was a consistent and persistent public advocate for civil rights, government accountability, family planning, and desegregation. In time, he shifted and in 1933 was fellowshipped as a Unitarian minister. Consider his context. He was raised during World War I in Europe, lived in the Depression in the U.S., was developing these shared Unitarian values well into World War II. He experienced fascism, was part of a world struggling to respond to communism, and he still held his long-term social justice concerns. In the mid-1940s, Reverend Davies was appointed to a national committee which was charged to advance the Unitarian faith. A decade later, he still was expounding on democracy. In a sermon in 1954, he offered, Unitarianism is an inclusive, not an exclusive faith based on individual freedom of belief, finding salvation not through someone else's martyrdom, but by education and the disciplines of democracy. He found democracy a saving force. He continued, A commitment of the Unitarian faith is to democracy, not merely as a political system, but as a just and brotherly way in human relations. We are educators one of another and all can learn from each. We are well aware that democracy can be a discipline and sometimes a harsh one, but that is part of its value. 
We grow by learning to get along with other people. We grow even more when we learn to respect and like each other, to have a concern, each for all. For Reverend Davies, democracy was not only a public institution, but also a moral institution. He worried democracy would be taken for granted. He saw modern democracy needed advocates and protection. Davies had seen the alternatives to democracy and put his trust in an engaged democracy, not a vote and move on democracy. He saw the best method of protection was to participate in and live into the deep ideals of living by working through differences. While humans have both a propensity to cooperate with one another in social groups for survival and fulfillment, we also have a propensity for violence within and among groups. We can observe by our own abilities this tension to both get along and to fight. We do our best to set up rules to try to resist this violence. Institutions of many sorts do this. Religion, at its best, is one of those institutions. It can help us to live together in compassion. I sense our trust in the institution of democracy is slipping. Our finding documents adjusted over time have checks and balances in a way that allow those governed to be governed how we are governed. Let's be real here too. The initial setup was for white male landowners to do the deciding and the governing. And slowly these principles have changed. The democracy created was to be deliberate and slow. This foundation is sturdy, but not a guarantee. I hear this as Davies' central point. The imperfect institution needs to be protected and improved, and this is the mantle we are called to carry. Modern democracy offers a path toward affirming the inherent worth and dignity of all. It is a moral assumption. It is a moral aspiration. Are we individually and collectively ready to risk for democracy, to heal democracy? Parker Palmer sees that it is a healing that is needed and finds our path to healing requires engagement. Palmer focuses on the role of citizen, a world citizen. He defines, citizenship is a way of being in the world rooted in the knowledge that I am a member of a vast community of human and non-human beings that I depend on for essentials I could never provide for myself. Palmer finds there is a hope for democracy that is, emerges when we learn to speak up without denying others their humanity. Democracy calls us to hold in tension individual freedom and collective responsibility. Democracy is about voting, but the democracy to work, we need to bring our whole selves into the process, head, heart, and energy. Earlier, we heard an excerpt from Parker Palmer's book, a call to deeply engage and a knowing that, yes, our hearts will break. Will our hearts break open to possibilities instead of breaking apart? Can we have a greater capacity to hold the complexities and contradictions of human experience? The result may be new life. Isn't that what it takes to live in democracy? To authentically participate, to listen and to speak up, to risk, to trust in a democratic system we know as imperfect and maybe in its most engaged form is our best hope to get through the challenges of human relations, to share ideas and feelings and imaginations. We are called as citizens in a democracy to hold life's many tensions consciously, faithfully, until our hearts 
are opened. It is in doing so that we sustain and build trust so we may live into the responsibility of governing ourselves. Where is a hope in a week like this? And a month like this? And a decade like this? In the muck of human experience, I see the hope is in the, the relationships and the capacity of the human heart to see more than one perspective and to trust you are not alone. In this week and in the months to come, may we each look for opportunities, however small, to build trust in the ongoing experiment that is democracy. Remembering democracy is, as Parker Palmer says, not something we have, but something we must do. May it be so. Just before I start, I would like to thank all of you for providing a safe sanctuary and a blessed place. I've come on a long journey, and I don't think I would have made it without you all. Thank you. Jack Layton's last letter to Canadians. All my life, I have worked to make things better. Hope and optimism have defined my political career, and I continue to be hopeful and optimistic about Canada. Young people have been a great source of inspiration to me. I have met and talked with so many of you about your dreams, your frustrations, and your ideas for change. More and more you are engaging in politics because you want to change things for the better. As my time in political life draws to a close, I want to share with you my belief in your power to change this country and this world. <laughs> there are great challenges before you from the overwhelming nature of climate change to the unfairness of an economy that excludes so many from our collective wealth and the changes necessary to build a more inclusive and generous Canada. I believe in you, your energy, your vision, your passion for justice are exactly what this country needs today. You need to be at the heart of our economy, our political life, and our plans for the present and the future. And finally, to all Canadians, Canada is a great country, one of the hopes of the world. We can be a better one, a country of greater equality, justice, and opportunity. My friends, love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, and we'll change the world. Blessed be. Amen. Words by John F. Kennedy. What kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not a peace of the grave or the security of slave. I'm talking about a genuine peace. The kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living. The kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. So let us not bind to our differences. But let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world a safe place for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortals. <laughs>